Have you ever been on a journey? Maybe it's a long car ride on a family vacation. Maybe it's a new job moving to a new city. Maybe it's going through school year after year and doing assignment after assignment. Maybe it's coming to the end of a career and looking towards retirement. All of us can relate to the idea of being on a journey. When I think of Jesus' life, in many ways, I see it as a journey, and that's sort of how the Gospels seem to lay out the life of Christ. It begins with Jesus leaving His throne in heaven, leaving the glory of the Father and being conceived in Mary's womb. Then the journey goes to Bethlehem where Jesus is born. And after Jesus is born, he and his parents take a journey to Egypt. And then they return from Egypt and they make their home in Nazareth. And Jesus grows up and he shows wisdom and understanding. And he marvels those who listen to him as he talks about the things of God. He grows up farther still, and at about the age of 30, he begins his ministry by being baptized by John the Baptist and having the Holy Spirit descend on him like a dove and having God the Father's voice come and say, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. He goes about walking through the country of Israel, and he logs many, many miles walking from place to place. Much of his time he spends in Galilee teaching and preaching and doing miracles. And then in the third year, probably he's around age 33, he begins his journey towards Jerusalem. And that's really, when you read the Gospels, most of the Gospels focus on the last days of Jesus' life, on his trip up to Jerusalem in his last week as he prepares to face the cross. And that's where we are this morning on this Good Friday. And, and, and the Gospels direct us, I think, in this way to show us that the cross, in many ways, is the end of this journey for Jesus. And that's where we are as we come to the Gospel of Mark this morning. So if you have your Bibles, turn there once again, and we're looking at verses 21 to 27 in Mark chapter 15. Jesus begins, these verses begin with Jesus on his way to the cross. And because we have this recorded for us in the Bible, we can go there in our mind's eye. We can, we can be, in some ways, through this description, we can be at the cross. And there's some important things this morning on this Good Friday as we sit at the foot of the cross, as we go to the foot of the cross with Christ. There's some things that are important that we be reminded of. Here's the first. That the road to the cross is the way of discipleship. Anyone who would choose to follow Jesus, anyone who would choose to believe upon His name for the forgiveness of their sins and become His disciples, must understand that it is a life of selfless surrender. The road to the cross is the way of discipleship. When we meet Jesus here in these first few verses, in verses 21 and 22, we find Him carrying His cross to the place where He would be crucified. He had already spent a sleepless night in the Garden of Gethsemane encouraging His disciples to pray. He had gone through the betrayal of one of His disciples named Judas who had turned Him over to the chief priests and teachers of the law. We had been in the garden where His disciples had drawn swords ready to defend Him, and yet He says, put your swords away. He's been to the trials. He stood before Caiaphas. He stood before Herod, and he stood before Pilate. He's been convicted, and he's been sentenced to die. And this is what we read after he's been sentenced to die, and he's on his way to be crucified. Verse 21 in Mark chapter 15 says this, A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, 
the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. At some point along the way, and this was very common for Romans to do this to people who had been sentenced to be crucified, was that they forced them to carry their own cross. Now, most historians, most commentators point out that Jesus probably did not carry his entire cross, but probably he was just carrying the cross beam of the cross. And it probably weighed anywhere from 75 to 120 pounds, depending on on the way the wood was cut and the type of the wood or how wet it was. It probably weighed somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 pounds. And somewhere along the journey, and and this was common as the Romans would force a person to carry their own cross through the streets so that they would be able to display very publicly this execution for all to see. Somewhere along the way in that journey, Jesus collapses under the weight. Now that's understandable when we think about this from a human perspective. Jesus, again, he spent the whole night, the whole previous night, he spent awake and in prayer. He had gone, and he had gone when he was before Pilate to be tried. He was beaten with Roman whips. And so he would have lost a tremendous amount of blood. They added to his insult by weaving a crown of thorns and pressing it upon the Lord's head, which the thorns would have pressed into his scalp and caused further bleeding and blood loss. It's understandable from a human perspective that Jesus would have collapsed. But you know, there's lots of times in the Gospel where we read about Jesus having strength, having energy that surpasses human understanding. He spends 40 days at the beginning of His ministry, 40 days in the desert without food. And yet, he's able to function. He's able to survive. And he's able to withstand the temptations of the devil. We remember that he's in the boat with his disciples and they say, Lord, like, take something to eat. And he says, I have, I have food that you know nothing about. He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. So there are times in the Gospels where God supernaturally sustains Jesus. He goes beyond what He's able to bear, but not here. Here, God allows Jesus to collapse under the weight of His cross. Why does God allow that to happen? Well, I think the reason why he allows that to happen is so that we would be introduced to this man, Simon from Cyrene. And Simon gives us a picture of discipleship. No one, no one would want to carry the cross of a condemned criminal through the streets as people jeered and mocked at the one who was going to be executed. That was especially true for a Jewish man, which is likely the case for Simon here. He didn't want to do this. We're told, did you see it there in verse 21, that the soldiers forced him to carry the cross. So you see that there is a surrendering of his own will and he has to bow to the will of the soldiers. He didn't like it. He didn't want it. But he's called to take up the cross. He's forced. He's pressed into this service. Try and imagine what that would have been like. He had to, maybe the cross, the beam was upon Jesus and he had to lift it off the Lord. Perhaps it fell to the side and he had to lift it directly up from the ground. But it was no light piece of lumber. He would have had to strain with his muscles to take this beam upon his shoulder. And then when he gets the beam upon his shoulder, his clothes and his face would then be stained with the blood of Christ. That's the image that we have here as Simon is forced to take the cross of Christ. And it's a picture of discipleship. This is exactly what Jesus said people would have to do. He said, you want to be my disciple? You want to follow me? Then you need to take up your cross every day and follow me. You need to surrender your life for my sake. 
This is a picture of discipleship. We live in a day and age where social media is really popular. People are on Facebook, people are on Twitter, and when I think there's another thing called Snapchat. I'm a little out of touch when it comes to social media, no question. But people, when they, they put pictures and they put stories on social media, it's, I find it fascinating that most people who put their life up on social media are trying to present the best picture possible, right? You have the, you have the picture of the happy family, and nobody gets to see the fight and the wrestling that took place moments before to get that family photo. You see the happy husband and wife at a restaurant, meanwhile they're fighting on the way home in the car. We see this picture of that's sanitized. We, 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 present this, we present this picture that's not really real of ourselves to kind of put our best foot forward. We sugarcoat the way life really is. I love the fact that the Bible never does that. The Bible never does that. Jesus never sugarcoats what it means to be his disciples. He says, he calls us to die to ourselves and live for the glory of God. To deny our own sinful desires, turn from what we want, uh, turn away from what we want, and turn towards what God wants. That is what discipleship is all about. Now, we want to be careful here to make sure that we're clear on what this means and, 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 and how our discipleship is, is like that of Simon's. You see, when Simon is carrying the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, he does not add anything to the work of Jesus. He does not atone for a single sin. He has nothing to do with what Jesus is going to do on the cross. And in the same way, as we take up our cross and we die to ourselves to live for Christ, we don't add to Christ's atonement. We don't earn our salvation. Not a single thing that we do makes us more right with God than when we first believe upon the person and work of Christ. That's not the point of discipleship. That's not the point of taking up our cross. When we take up our cross, it doesn't make us more right with God. What it does is it shows that we belong to Jesus. It shows that we're willing to walk in the same steps that He walked in. In, in other words, it shows that we're willing to put aside our own desires and live for the glory and purposes of God. It shows that we like Simon would have been, at least to some degree, covered by the blood of Christ. You know what it means to be a Christian. You want to know what it means to follow Jesus. Then you need to look to the cross. It's the cross that shows us the way of discipleship. In the next few verses, we're introduced to some more people. We We've met Simon, and he shows us this picture of discipleship. In these next few verses, we're introduced to some soldiers. We're introduced to some criminals who are crucified along Jesus. We're introduced to those who are passing by along the way to see Jesus as he's upon the cross. We're introduced to the religious leaders who stand at the foot of the cross and see the Lord Jesus in His suffering. And all these people show us a second lesson that we must learn at the foot of the cross. It's this, that at the cross, Jesus endured great shame. No one in all the universe is more worthy of praise and exaltation than the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet here, at the cross, we find Jesus in extreme humiliation, enduring great shame. At the cross, we see Jesus enduring great shame. It's an awful scene here in verses 23 through 32. Listen. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see what each would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him the written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults, shaking their heads and saying, So, you are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and teachers of the law mocked him 
among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults upon him. We see here that God is sovereign over all of this. It seems as though Jesus is helpless in enduring these shame, this shame, but there's a few tips here. There's a few things that point us in another direction. First of all, Jesus is offered wine mixed with myrrh. They would do that in order to deaden the pain. It was kind of like a crude anesthetic for people who were about to be crucified. But notice here, did you see it in this verse, that Jesus refuses the offer. He doesn't drink it. He doesn't drink it. He does so that he, so he will remain alert and keep his wits about him as he endures this cross. It's an example of Jesus' conscious choice to endure this. And then we see the soldiers, after they stripped him, they make wagers. They cast lots, we're told in the verse here, which is sort of the equivalent of rolling dice. They cast lots for his clothes. If you were listening when we read Psalm 22 this morning, you know that that comes right from Psalm 22, which is a prophecy of what the Messiah would have to endure. And so you see that Scripture is fulfilled even in the shame, even in the mockery Scripture is being fulfilled. It's a reminder that Jesus, that God the Father, that the Holy Spirit are in charge of this whole thing. They're sovereign over it. We see Jesus stripped, which means He's either entirely naked or mostly naked upon the cross. The Romans would do that to expose a person to the elements, but also to humiliate them for all to see. We find Jesus among common criminals, though He, as Jason, Pastor Jason rightly pointed out, had never done anything wrong. Here He is among common criminals, and even the criminals are heaping insults upon Him. Above His head is His charge, this is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Then there's the insults of those who passed by. He claimed to do all these things. He claimed to have all this power. Why doesn't He save Himself? Then there's the insults of the religious leaders. He saved others, but He can't save Himself. There's great irony in what we see in the shame that Jesus is enduring here. The sign above Him says, King of the Jews. He is a King. He is the King of the Jews, but He's far more than that. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. The religious leaders admit that He saved others. You see, Jesus had done so many miracles, and in fact, when you read the Gospels, you find that the religious leaders had witnessed many of the miracles. They never denied Jesus' power to do miracles. He saved others, they said, but He saved Himself. Come down off the cross. Then we would see so that we might see and believe. They admit that He has power to save others, but they think, they wrongly conclude that He doesn't have the power to save Himself. But He does. They say, come down so that we might see and believe, but the question that we must ask is, what kind of good would that kind of faith do? If Jesus were to come down on the cro from the cross and they were to believe that He were the Messiah his, and He had not paid for sins yet, He had not atoned for sins, what good would their faith be? It would be of no value. Jesus, in fact, had more than enough power to end the shame of the crucifixion. You may recall when He was in the garden with his disciples and they drew swords and they were ready to fight to free him from those who were about to arrest him. He told them to put away their swords and he said to them, I could at a word call 12 legions of angels, which is thousands upon thousands of angels, and they would rescue me. Jesus did have the power. He could have called legions of angels. How quickly do you think the soldiers would have returned his clothes at the sight of thousands upon thousands of angels. 
How quickly do you think that the jeers and the ridicule would cease at the sight of thousands upon thousands of angels? Instead of mocking Him, the religious leaders would be trembling in fear. He could have done that, but He doesn't. What that means is that Jesus is willfully enduring all the shame of the cross. Have you ever experienced a moment of embarrassment where people are laughing at you for something that you've done or something that's been done to you? I've experienced that on a number of occasions, and I can tell you on most of those occasions, if I could have stopped it, I would have. Jesus could have stopped it, but He doesn't. He endures it. The One who deserves praise upon praise for all eternity here endures the shame of the cross. But there's more for us to see here than just the human element. There's more for us to see here than just the beating that Jesus receives from the Roman soldiers. There's more for us to see than just the people mocking Him as they pass by. There's more for us to see here. You see, it's not just the things that happen to Him that we can see through the human experience, the physical reality. There's also a spiritual reality that's happening as Jesus is upon the cross. We might ask the question, why is Jesus willing to endure all of this shame? And the reason why Jesus is willing to endure all this shame is to display the glory of God's love. For, here's the third thing that we must be reminded of as we stand at the cross, Upon the cross, Jesus endures the punishment of sin. Christ does not deserve an ounce of what He's going through on the cross. He's taking what we deserve. You want to know what our sins deserve? Our rebellion against God deserves? The cross gives us a window into that. The utter shame and humiliation, the pain and the suffering. That's what we deserve. But rather than us receiving that upon the cross, Jesus endures the punishment for sin. Look at verses, verse 33. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. Now the sixth hour, as far as Jewish people kept time in the first century, meant that that was noon. It was lunchtime. It was the middle of the day. That's when the sun would normally be shining the brightest. And here we find that darkness came over the land. Now, there's no shortage of commentators that want to offer a natural explanation for this. Some want to say that, well, it, was really, it got really, really cloudy, and therefore it was dark. Some people want to say, well, you know, it's pretty common in that area to have a dust storm, and so it was just a great dust storm that rose up and created the darkness. Some people say, well, maybe it was a, an eclipse where the moon passed in front of the sun, and that's what created darkness. The darkness, but that's not the sense of the text here. There is no natural explanation for what happens here. The the sense of the darkness that comes over the land, and whether that be the land of Israel or whether that be the entire earth, this is utter darkness, and the people that experience it feel it in a way that they have never felt before. This is not a natural occurrence, but rather it is an act of God. Why darkness? For three hours as Jesus is upon the cross. I believe because it's in that time that Jesus takes the sin of the world, of all those who would believe upon His name, He takes it upon Himself, and He endures the punishment that we deserve upon the cross. We're told this in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that on the cross God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. 1 Peter 2.24 also says this, He Himself, that is talking about the Lord Jesus, bore our sins in His body on the tree. That's on the cross 
so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By His wounds we have been healed. The spiritual reality of what's taking place here is that Jesus is bearing the weight of all the sins of all the people who would believe upon His name. We need to see that if we're going to understand verse 34. Here's what Jesus says in verse 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is experiencing in this moment something that is completely foreign to his nature. Never once in all eternity past, never once as, he, as a human being when, when he was growing up in his entire life, never once had Jesus committed sin. He had always known perfect fellowship with the Father. He had always known perfect righteousness. And now in this horrifying moment, he takes sin Upon himself, the scale of which is difficult to imagine. Just imagine for a moment that every one of your sins, every one of your sins is like a weight that only weighs an ounce, that only weighs an ounce. And that that sin, that weight, is put in a backpack and, and you have to carry it around. Now even though one sin only weighs an ounce, think about, try and think about how many sins you've committed in your whole life. How heavy do you think that backpack would be? It would be an unbearable load. And that's just the sin of one person, let alone Jesus bearing the weight of all our sin. And He bears it all here on the cross. Then we read this in verses 35 through 37. When some of those standing near hear this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, filled the sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes and takes him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. These verses give us a sense of the completeness of the work of Christ upon the cross. It was thought in Jesus' day that if a righteous man were in trouble and he were truly righteous, that God would send the prophet Elijah to rescue him from his trouble. And so when Jesus is crying out here, there's a sense in which, well, maybe, maybe Elijah will come and rescue him. We're told in John's Gospel that Jesus also said that he was thirsty and asked for some wine vinegar and people, or asked for something to drink and people brought him wine vinegar, which is, which is like a, a, the ancient world's version of coffee. It was a, it was a way to uh, pick you up. It was a stimulant and it was also very effective for quenching your thirst. And so we see Jesus has a sobering moment here as he tastes this wine vinegar and the thought is okay he's got some alertness he's crying out to the lord let's wait and see let's see if god rescues this man i mean he, he's claimed to be all these things he's done all these miracles maybe he is a righteous man maybe god will save him but that's not what happens that's not what happens there is no rescue elijah doesn't come we're told in verse 37 here that Jesus breathed his last. With a loud cry, with his last ounce of strength, humanly speaking, Jesus cries out the words as were recorded for us in the Gospel of John, it is finished. And he dies. These verses give us a sense of the completeness that Jesus paid the full price. Not just some, not just most. Jesus doesn't leave us with any of our sin. When we believe upon Christ, He takes all of our sin. Everyone that we've committed in the past, everyone that we've committed today, everyone that we'll commit in the future, He takes it all so that no sin remains upon us. It all goes to Him. He bears the punishment of all our sins. As we stand at the foot of the cross this morning, we need to grieve 
brothers and sisters. Don't turn away from the horror of what Jesus endured because He endures it for our sake. He endures it because of what we have done. We need to grieve at the cross. But at the foot of the cross, we can also rest in the great assurance that Jesus has paid it all. And people wonder, have I done enough? When am I going to be right with God? When am I going to be good enough for God? And the answer is never if you look to yourself. But if we look to Jesus, we can rest in what He has accomplished for our sake. There's something else that we need to see as we stand at the foot of the cross this morning. Here's the fourth thing. At the cross, worship is dramatically changed. The sufficiency, the completeness of the cross removes the barriers that were in place to worship a holy God. At the cross, worship is dramatically changed. The impossible is accomplished in verse 38. Listen to what Mark says to us here, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The temple in the Old Testament, the tabernacle in the Old Testament were commanded by God to be built as a means of worship. And when you read about the building of the temple in the book of Exodus, or the tabernacle in the book of Exodus, and the temple in the book of 1 Kings, you learn that in the tabernacle and in the temple, there are different sections in this place of worship. It's divided up. And in the, in the place that is considered to be most holy, called the Holy of Holies, that's where God caused His presence to dwell in a special way. He made His presence known to the people there in a way unlike He does anywhere else. And that place is blocked off by a curtain. See, not everybody could go and be in the visible presence of God. Not everybody could go where He had manifest His glory in this special way. In fact, only one person could go there, and he could only go there once a year, and that was the high priest. But here, at the cross, we see that temple, which is, we see that curtain in the temple, which is a barrier between people and God. We see it torn in two. We see it removed. Jesus has accomplished what no one else could. How does he accomplish this? Well, we learn that from an unlikely source here in verse 39. When the centurion, who is a Roman soldier, a Gentile, not a Jewish man. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man is the Son of God. This centurion would have, would have executed many people throughout his career. He would have stood at the foot of many crosses, but never had he stood at the foot of the cross like that of the Lord Jesus. Now whatever he means when he calls Jesus the Son of God, he may not understand it in the fullness of what it truly means theologically, but whatever he means as the words come out of his mouth, he's exactly right. How is Jesus able to accomplish the removal of this barrier between God and man? How is Jesus able to accomplish the forgiveness, pay the debt of all the sins of all the people who would come to him? How is He able to do that? He's able to do it because in His humanity, He is perfectly sinless. And in His divinity, He's able to apply the infinite nature of who He is to His sacrifice. And therefore, there is room at the cross for you. If you you wonder whether or not Jesus is able to forgive your sins, He is. He is. No matter how many come, as many as would come, He's able to pay their debt. And so, worship is dramatically changed. We no longer come to God through priests. In the Old Testament, if you wanted to worship God, you needed to go to the temple, you needed to bring your sacrifice, you needed to give it to the priest, and then He would offer it on your behalf. 
We don't need a priest to come to God. We're no longer on the outer courts of the temple. The best we could ever accomplish if we were living in the Old Testament, would we could just get to the outskirts. We could just look at the outside of the building and wonder what it's like on the inside, never having access to the glory of God. No longer are we on the outskirts because the temple curtain is torn in two and we are welcomed in. We don't come through priests. We don't stand on the outer courts, but rather we come by faith in Christ. Jesus foretold this when He met a Samaritan woman at a well, you may recall. She asked Him the question, where should we worship? Who's right about worship? Is it the Samaritans? Should we worship God here? Or should we worship God at the temple in Jerusalem? And Jesus said, you should worship at the temple in Jerusalem. But, He says, a time is coming when people will worship neither on this mountain nor at the temple in Jerusalem, but rather worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. That's a great privilege for us, especially, that's especially poignant for us this morning as we're sitting in our homes and we're separated from one another physically and yet we're joined together in heart and by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we don't need to be in this building to worship. It's a wonderful building. I love it. I can't wait till we're back together. But we can worship anywhere. Why? Because of what Jesus does at the cross. There's a great neglect, I fear, in the church today of biblical knowledge. People don't know their Bibles like they should as believers anymore. I think that's particularly true of knowing the Old Testament. Most people neglect the reading of the Old Testament. But what you discover if you take that seriously and you read it, what you discover rather quickly is that it is utter foolishness to think that you can earn your salvation, that you can make yourself right with God. God's standard is impossible for sinners to meet. We've broken His law innumerable times. The law, the Old Testament shows us that we need grace. The Old Testament shows us that we need a Savior. And praise God, we have one in Jesus Christ. He's changed the way we worship. worship. There's lots to behold as we stand at the cross. We see the cross when we look at the road to the cross. We see that it is the way of discipleship. At the cross, we see that Jesus willfully endured great shame. We see that upon the cross, Jesus endured the punishment of all our sin. And we see that at the cross, worship is changed. But as we come to the end of our verses this morning, we meet some more people who were at the cross, some of Jesus' most faithful followers, and they show us something very important. Here's the last thing that we need to see at the foot of the cross. We need to see that the cross seems like the end, but it is really a new beginning. When Jesus is nailed to the cross, Jesus' enemies think they've won. This troublemaker, this man who keeps drawing great crowds and threatens to rob us of our power, he's gone and he's dead. His enemies think that they've won. His friends, his disciples, think that all is lost. There they are. Their master, their friend, dead upon the cross. Their journey with Him has come to an end. The cross seems like it's the end, but... The cross, through the cross, the Lord is making a way, has made a way to make all things new. The cross seems like the end, but it is really a new beginning. Here we see some faithful followers of Christ in verses 40 and 41. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joses, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. Here are these faithful women. When everybody else had abandoned Jesus, these women are there and and they're at the foot of the cross. But all they can do, the only thing they can do 
is watch. If they had the power, if they had the authority, I'm sure they would have wanted to rescue Jesus, but they have no power. They can just watch as Jesus dies. It's a heart-wrenching moment as these women who have loved and have followed and have served Jesus are standing there helpless, able to do nothing for Him. And then this happens in verses 42 through 46. It was preparation day. That is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he heard from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph brought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Joseph of Arimathea goes to Pilate and he asks for his body. Now this was a bold move on on Joseph's part because Pilate was probably a little annoyed at the members of the council, at the members of the Sanhedrin. So he probably didn't want to see any more members of the council that day. And then there's also the fact that the members of the council would have been miffed at Joseph for going to show this act of kindness to the Lord Jesus. But nevertheless, we're told here by Mark that Joseph goes boldly to Pilate and asks for the body. When Pilate hears the news, he's a bit surprised that Jesus has already died because crucifixion was intended to be a long-term process. It could sometimes stretch out for days on end. And that's the reason why the religious leaders come to Pilate a little earlier than this and they ask him to have the legs of the criminals broken so that they would die quickly before the Sabbath came. And so when Joseph shows up shortly after and asks for his body, Pilate's scratching his head. Wait a minute, he's not dead yet. I just sent the soldiers out to break his legs so that he would die. It seems as though Jesus has died quickly. And so Pilate, knowing that there cannot be any survivors of crucifixion, wants to make sure. You see, the Romans had crucified literally hundreds of thousands of people as they ruled the Mediterranean part of the world for so many centuries, and never once, not in all of recorded history, of all the people who were ever crucified, not one person has ever survived. And the reason for that is because the Romans know how to kill people. And he wants to make sure, before he releases the body, he wants to make sure that Jesus is dead. The sentence has been made, and it must be carried out. Well, the centurion comes back with news, probably... What happened was Pilate sent a messenger to the centurion, and the centurion sent a messenger back to Pilate. And the centurion knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is dead, because having just broken the legs of the other two criminals and having come to Jesus, the soldiers had thrust a spear in his side, probably up under his ribcage, into his lung, and perhaps piercing his heart. There is no doubt about it. Jesus is dead. And so the body is given to Joseph. And because it's the Sabbath and sundown is coming, we're told that he takes some linen and he wraps the body quickly. He makes these rushed preparations and he lays Jesus in a tomb. A tomb that is cut out of stone. In other words, it's a sense that it's impenetrable. Nobody can get in it easily. And then to make matters more final or to make matters more complete, there's a stone that is rolled across the entrance of the tomb. It's over. Jesus is dead. And He's buried. It seems like the end. But then we read this in verse 47. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph, Joseph saw where He was laid. Now, why bother with that? Why bother? Why does Mark bother telling us that Mary and Mary saw where Jesus is laid? Why bother telling us that? The reason why he tells us that is because they're coming back. 
They go to see where Jesus is laid because after the Sabbath is over, on that Sunday morning, the first day of the week, they want to go to where Jesus is laid and they want to give Him a more proper burial. It's an indication, this witnessing of where Jesus laid is an indication that there's more to come here. But it's not what the women expect. They expect when they get up early that Sunday morning, they expect when they make their way down to the tomb, what are they going to find? They're going to find Jesus' lifeless body there. That's what they're expecting because they think it's the end. But that's not what happens. As we'll see on Sunday, this Sunday when we gather again for worship, Jesus won't be there. The tomb will be empty. He will be raised from the dead. And what that will show is that the cross was not the end. The cross was not a defeat, but rather Jesus on the cross won a great victory. The greatest victory ever in the history of the world, a victory over sin and death, a victory that will enable God to justly forgive our sins and welcome us into His presence forever and ever. That's what the cross does. It's not the end, but rather it's the beginning. It's the beginning of making all things new. There's much for us to see as we stand at the foot of the cross. We see it as the way of discipleship. You want to be a Christian? You need to die to yourself and live for Christ. We see the shame that Jesus endures. And He does it willfully because He could have put an end to it at any moment. We see that Jesus endures the full punishment of sin. Not an ounce, not a smidgen remains. We see that worship is dramatically changed. And we see that the cross is not the end. But it's rather a new beginning. Let's pray together. Father, I thank You for this opportunity to stand at the foot of the cross together as Your people. Lord, we do not want to move quickly through the atonement of the Lord Jesus. We do not want to move quickly through His suffering and agony. Oh God, help us to not be callous to what Jesus has accomplished on the cross on our behalf. But Lord, let us sober-mindedly look at the horror of the cross. Let us grieve over our own sin, I pray. But, oh, Father, I thank You and praise You that we are not left in the grief and the sorrow of the cross. But rather, as we stand at the foot of the cross, we can also look towards the empty tomb. We can know that death has been defeated in the Lord Jesus Christ and know that we have a hope of being raised to life with You forever. Thank You for the cross, oh God. Make it clear in our minds and hearts, I pray. In Jesus' name.